um, welcome to the second edition of the Red Pill. Um, topic of this video is going to be money. Um, I kind of see the Matrix as this giant, many tentacled octopus, which has, you know, which reaches into and orchestrates um, every aspect of our lives. Um, I'm starting with money because in today's world, money is the um, primary driving force behind pretty much everything that we do and is the dominant factor in pretty much every decision which is made. Um, we've become so used to using money to um, organise our lives that we take it almost completely for granted and tend not to question too much exactly what it is and where it comes from. So there are three things that I want to focus on in this video. In fact, it's going to be two videos. I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to do a second one on, the, on, on, on today's actual monetary system. Um, but today, in this one, I want to concentrate on two things. Firstly, the origins of money, uh, where do its roots lie exactly, where did it come from? And secondly, is it actually useful? You know, we tend to think of money as being an efficient way of organising society, moving capital and labour and resources around the place. Um, but I want to examine that question and see, is it actually a useful thing for us? Uh, the third one, which is going to be in a second video, otherwise this one's going to be too long, the third one is going to be on the actualities of our monetary system and precisely how our monetary system functions. Um, and I think once you've watched these two videos, you will agree with me that money is not at all how we think of it. It's very much fundamental to the matrix. Um, it is. Uh, it controls us in, in all sorts of ways. Um, and as I say, I hope to elucidate some of those. So let's go. There's a commonly held belief that um, human societies, early human societies, bartered extensively and that uh, money somehow evolved um, out of that in order to facilitate transactions um, and became a universal medium of exchange, you know, to avoid the problem of how many chickens is my donkey worth, you know, this, this kind of thing. Um, but actually this is not so. I'd like to draw your attention at this point to a chap by the name of David Graeber who writes extensively um, about social anthropology um, and in his book um, Debt, The First 5,000 Years, chapter 2 of that is called The Myth of Barter and in that he explains that there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever to support the supposition that early human societies bartered with each other extensively um, and that um, in his book The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith um, he described this scenario where a baker and a butcher, you know, you have a baker who's made bread, you have a butcher who's made meat, the baker wants meat, but the butcher doesn't want any bread. Uh, and so the baker has to go through potentially a very long series of exchanges, exchanging his bread for some eggs and then the eggs for whatever until he eventually gets to something that the butcher will exchange for his meat and that money evolved out of this, but uh, he assumed this, Adam Smith made this assumption, he said it seemed like a logical supposition to him, but that's all it was, was a supposition. Um, the implication of this is that this um, quid pro quo exchange based mentality is somehow a fundamental part of human nature and that you know even early disorganized societies bartered and that barter became more and more complicated and therefore there was the need for money. Um, what if that is not true? What if humans are not naturally quid pro quo exchange based but are naturally collaborative beings happy to just contribute to the collective because they understand that that is for the good of everyone. The truth is that money, that money came into being as a way of doing two things controlling a standing army or being able to maintain a standing army and uh, being able to manipulate your population's labour to produce that which you as the ruler of an empire want. Um, it is my contention that, as is in keeping with the matrix, that we have a false perception of money um, that is not evolved naturally out of, out, of, uh, out of a bartering system in order to facilitate trade, um, but actually was invented, if you like, or came into being as a way of um, controlling one's empire and maintaining one's grip on the population. So I mean, think about it, soldiers produce nothing, but they still have to be housed, they still have to be fed, they have to be equipped. So before they were paid armies, soldiers were also, insofar as they were soldiers, soldiers were also farmers, they were tanners, they were blacksmiths, they were bakers, whatever, and so they had real value, real use in society. Um, 
but having large numbers of mostly young men removed from the workforce of a society obviously places an undue burden on everybody else. They have to work harder and produce more just for the society as a whole to have the same. And so money was um, the means by which soldiers were A, paid to compensate them for the fact that they were risking their lives, um, but that payment would mean nothing if they weren't able to exchange those gold coins as they were initially for goods and services, whores, whatever, uh, when they were not off, when they were not busy um, fighting wars. Similarly, a population is relatively easily controlled if the ruling class, by use of its soldiers, takes control of the things which are essential to life, the arable land, the water, the energy production, um, and then restricts access to these things. Population can no longer feed and water and heat itself um, because the, the, the rulers through their soldiers control access to these things. Um, and so access to the population is granted by the exchanging of money for those essential goods and services. Um, and in order to obtain the money, the population now has to submit to whatever tasks the ruling classes require of them. Um, and they may not be things which are particularly useful to the society as a whole and are useful only to that ruling class. So integral to the concept of money are also the concepts of property, of trade and above all of empire. And the truth about the origins of money is that it started as a way of paying one's armies um, because let's face it, if you have an army which is paid, a full-time army, it has a massive advantage over an army which is part-time uh, and whose members are actually needed by the society that they've come from. And um, back in the day, before there were standing armies, if, if a t pair of tribes did come into conflict, the most common way of resolving that conflict, if it wasn't able to be done um, peacefully, was for each tribe to send one champion and the conflict would be resolved by the outcome of the fight between those two people because they couldn't spare the workforce. For those of you who don't want to spend hours and hours of your life reading hundreds of pages of David Graeber, um, on the screen now is a link to a relatively short article um, which explains the ideas of, of, about uh, the myth of Barter as well. Um, and if you miss that, I will try to remember to put a link on the uh, description. If I seem to be talking a lot about um, soldiers and military and armies and war and uh, so on in an episode that's supposed to be about money, well, that's because they are so inextricably linked. Um, I'm going to play a clip now of um, a section of one of Mike Maloney's videos on the hidden secrets of money, the seven part series that he did. I highly recommend watching them, they're very informative, really watchable, he's a very likeable guy. They're about 20 minutes, half an hour long each and there's a, a total of seven of them. Um, I've just picked a little clip here just to show um, how history repeats itself and um, to show how money is so closely linked to military power and military might. And the Athens star shone brightly for many years. So this begs the question, what went wrong? How did such a great and powerful civilization fall? The answer lies in the same pattern that we see throughout history. Too much greed and too much war. It was when the Athenians got involved in the Peloponnesian Wars, a war with Sparta, that their monetary problems began. First, they lost access to their gold and silver mines. They were also paying armies that were on foot and they were miles and miles away from Athens. So as they pay their armies to buy goods and services from the local populations, a deflation occurs in Athens because they're sending all of their coinage out of the city. Then they started debasing their coinage to pay for the war. If you take in a thousand coins in taxes, and then you melt those down, those gold coins, and you mix 50% copper into your gold, now you can mint 2,000 coins. So if you take in only 1,000 coins, but you spend 2,000 coins, what is that called? That is deficit spending. Athens began to do that during this war with Sparta. They also had these great public works, which were very expensive and they finished the Temple of Athena Nike during the truce in the middle. There was a six-year truce in the middle of this 27-year war. So they didn't stop their great public works and allow their market economy to heal from the expense of this war. As they debased their coinage, people would take the new debased coins at face value at first until 
There were a whole bunch of those, and there's something called Gresham's Law where people tend to uh, save to keep the thing that's rare, and they spend the thing that's common into circulation first. So all of the gold and silver coins started to disappear from circulation and become quite rare, and it was just these copper coins. Suddenly, it took a whole bunch of copper coins to buy a gold or silver coin, one of those old gold or silver coins. This is the first time that gold or silver ever had a price. Before that, everything was measured in a weight of gold and silver. So a large factor in Athens' downfall was the expense of war, the expansion of empire, the debasement of their currency, the eventual inflation that was caused. You know, they minted these coins until they became nothing but flecks of copper. This was actually the world's first hyperinflation. And what it did was it financially debilitated Athens to the point where in 404 BC they surrendered to Sparta. And eventually they became nothing but a satellite of Rome. The thing that amazes me is how history just keeps on repeating and repeating and repeating. And we never learn from all of our stupid mistakes. We just repeat the same stupid mistakes over and over and over again. Today we are doing the same thing that the Athenians did that caused the loss of their great culture. We're doing the same currency debasement. We're doing the same deficit spending. And it's for the same reasons. It's for war and it's for great public works. And so to summarize, and this is the matrix, remember, so nothing is as it seems to be. Money did not come about as a consequence of natural human activity and the desire to trade with each other. Um, rather, it did three things. Number one, it enabled ever more sophisticated, costly and brutal wars to be fought. Um, it made possible the control of populations by a very, very, very small ruling class. And thirdly, and for me most importantly, it warps our minds into thinking of ourselves as being in competition with each other, as being commercial beings, rather than being collaborative, uh, cooperative, communal beings, you know, happy to simply give as we can uh, for the collective good. So what I'm going to do now is take a look at whether money, um, despite its somewhat inauspicious beginnings, uh, does actually function as a useful tool in our society. So uh, on to part two. If you ask one of our modern day free market neoliberal economists whether money is useful, they will tell you it most certainly is because it's the most efficient way to move capital and resources and labor. Um, that the desire to accumulate wealth spurs innovation and creativity in the economy and that uh, competition in the market keeps prices down and um, increases productivity and that these things are of benefit to everyone. But in my opinion these arguments don't really stand up to scrutiny and in order to explain the idea I've come up with a few scenarios. Um, the first two are same, same but different, as they say in Thailand. Um, imagine two drug, well, several drug companies. Yeah, a new disease, AIDS, is a not a bad example. So the AIDS virus comes along, and all of the major drug companies immediately start pouring lots and lots of resources into finding a treatment or a cure for the disease. One of them is going to win this race, right? And they're going to patent that drug and they're going to make a fortune. And all of the other drug companies who invested all of that time and money and paid all of their researchers, that becomes pretty much wasted effort. Not to mention the fact that the next drug that company develops is going to have to be more expensive because of all the manpower that they've invested fruitlessly in the, uh, in the quest for the AIDS cure. In another scenario, Imagine you have two inventors and they both come up with a design for, say, a water desalination device. And um, both of those people patent their devices and they enter the market and they're now in competition with each other for a share of that market. In order to um, win share of that market, they are going to try and keep costs down. In order to keep costs down, they may use inferior materials. They may not pay their workforce enough. No doubt each inventor sees merit in the other's design, but they can't incorporate anything too similar to the other person's design for fear of being sued for patent infringement. In both of these scenarios, if instead of seeking profit, 
what was being sought was the best possible water desalination device or as speedy a cure as possible for AIDS, then surely the most sensible course is collaboration. But under a monetary system where profit is the primary goal, and remember these companies have a legal responsibility to maximise profits for their shareholders. So in a money-based system where profit trumps everything, collaboration on projects like this becomes almost impossible. So in both of these cases, by simply collaborating and sharing ideas and sharing expertise, the best possible solution could be arrived at in the shortest possible time. You wouldn't need to produce, um, you wouldn't need to package it, make it look pretty, um, and they could be built as out of the best possible materials and be built to last as long, be as reliable and, and as durable as possible. Again, in a money-based system, the incentive to produce products which fail after a period of time so that they need to be repaired or replaced, i.e. giving you the chance to sell spare parts or have a service network to back your products up, you know, all of these things are now incentivized under a monetary system um, and making the best possible goods out of the best possible materials to last the longest possible time is disincentivized. And so under a monetary system it becomes very hard to trust anybody's motives, you know, to know if they're doing what they can for you or whether they're just trying to fleece you. If a mechanic, for example, says to you, you need a new cam belt in your car, is this because your cam belt is about to go or because the mechanic wants to make a few quid out of you because you don't know any better? You know, this is the thing, you never really know when money's driving everything. And of course, if a human being is performing a task just for money, where they have no personal investment in it, they have no personal stake in it, and they have no um, love for what they're doing, then they're not going to be doing the job very well, are they? They're going to do it. They're going to do the bare minimum they can to collect their paycheck because that's all they're doing the job for. So you know, right now we have a situation where if somebody wants to build a factory to make a product of some kind, they are raising finance. They're you know buying the site. They're paying builders to build the buildings, they're paying fitters and engineers to come in and tool the factory up, they're um, training their workers, they're paying their workers a wage, and also that ultimately they can profit from it, yeah, it's all about them. Imagine instead a world that was not controlled completely by money, you know, right now we think that in order to do that, to build that factory, you need money, right? But you don't actually. You need the land, you need the guys to come and build the buildings, you need the materials, you need the machines, you need trained people to, to man the machines. Um, but you don't actually need money, you need those things. So imagine a world where money was not the organizing principle and instead, you know, a, 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 somebody came up with an idea for a product that they thought would benefit large numbers of people and said, listen, hey, we need to build a factory, this is what we need. People would contribute because they could see the benefit to themselves and to, 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 the, to the community at large. So you don't actually need money. We've been completely brainwashed by the whole concept of money. You know, a wise man once said that if you have to pay a man to do a job, then it probably wasn't worth doing in the first place. This is bullshit. On the subject of bullshit, if you enjoy a laugh, type George Carlin bullshit into the YouTube window. Many studies have shown that um, paying people for coming up with ideas actually is counterproductive. It actually somehow disincentivizes it. You know, ask any author that's been given a hundred thousand pound advance on a deadline um, and been told to write a great book. How do they feel? How creative and how spontaneous do they feel? Far from spurring innovation and creativity, actually a monetary system stifles it because a lot of ideas have patents slapped on them and so nobody else gets to see them, nobody else gets to refine and improve them. You know, it really limits the number of minds that can work, that can work on any given problem. And if not a patent, then a top secret label, the label gets slapped on them. And a lot of the really, really cool inventions we've never even seen, we don't know anything about. You know, the military has gobbled them up so that they can come up with cleverer ways of uh, killing people without risking their own soldiers. Consider another situation. Um, around the world every year, some 40% of the food which is produced is destroyed. And at the same time, we have hundreds of thousands, hundreds of millions of people, sorry, not hundreds of thousands, hundreds of millions of people on or near starvation. So it would seem obvious to simply 
send this surplus food overseas to try and feed the starving of the world, right? But under a monetary system, you can't do that. If you start giving your products away for free, this lowers the market value of your products, and all of a sudden, you are making less money. So, you know, it seems like madness that we can't just give our spare food away, but that's the reason why, because profits would suffer. And, and so rather than give up a few dollars in profits, millions and millions and millions of people are allowed to starve. So um, financial expediency outweighs human life. Really? Consider that stat for a moment, and that's 30,000 children. The estimate for total number of people is 100,000 people every single day die on this planet due to lack of food and preventable disease and lack of access to clean water. And this is not because there is not enough food on this planet, that there's not enough medicine on this planet, or there's not enough water on this planet. The simple fact is they don't have enough money. And that is why 100,000 people on a day on this planet die. That is what our monetary system does to us. So in summary, um, is the monetary system efficient? Well, no, it's not. Not if 30 million people are dying unnecessary preventable deaths every year as a consequence of not having enough money. When people talk about the monetary system being efficient, what it's efficient at doing is impoverishing the majority of people whilst enriching a very, very few people, but I'll go into that in the next video. Does it motivate? Well, no, not really. Artists, musicians, inventors, scientists, uh, these people don't create in response to financial incentive. The, you know, creation is a, is, a, is a process that comes from within. Um, if one's motivation to go to work is purely to earn money so that you can buy the things that you need to live. Well, this is not motivation, this is coercion. And um, does it spur innovation? Well, no, it does the exact opposite of that. Proprietary constraints um, and selective financing from governments mean that uh, the advancing of technology is actually slowed down. I mean, can you imagine if the whole concept of proprietary information was removed and everything was open source and so if someone has an idea they put it out there on the internet other people can check it out try it out build a prototype refine it adapt it to their particular circumstances you know the rate of advance of technology would make what we're doing right now look snail like in comparison and so that's it for this edition um, I'm going to finish with um, a little comedy clip just to lighten the mood, because I don't know about you, but I've found this to be really quite depressing thinking about all of this. Not that I don't think about it all the time, um, but if you think this was depressing, wait until the next one when I explain the particulars of how our modern day monetary system actually functions. Um, and you will not believe it. It is without a doubt the most magnificent scam ever perpetrated. So uh, I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. I just worry. You know, finances, I got a little boy, I'm worried about his whole financial future. People are already giving me crap. Well, you should have started saving for his college three years ago, Tom. That's 30 grand a year minimum. Like 30 grand? All right. Well, he's going to be home college then. You know? <laughs> I'll be teaching him that money is not important. Uh, uh. Which isn't true, right? Money's really the most important thing, which is kind of, it's because uh, it's just made up, you know, it kinda, it's weird to me, you know. It's so really, by every definition, money is our God, if you think about it. It's what we worship. It's what we work 40, 50 hours a week for. It's what we want more than anything. It's what we think will make us happy. We have altars built all over the world in the form of banks that we bail out. Right? Yeah, I don't know how it works, to be honest. I don't even get a check anymore. They just wire it to my account. I press some buttons. It spits it out to me. I don't know how that works. It's faith. Uh, yeah. How many of y'all haven't stood in front of the, uh, the altar of an ATM machine and prayed a little bit? <laughs> Dear God, please let there be a hundred dollars in my account. <laughs> Don't let this guy behind me have a gun. <laughs> mm. Mm.
I trust it, right? I used to not worry about it before my son. I didn't worry about it at all. Like national debt, I'd be like, we owe trillions of dollars, really? To who? Ourselves? Okay, well, if I owe myself $100, I'll be like, you know what? Screw it. We good. You know? <laughs> I'm going to let that slide. But we don't owe that money to ourselves. National debts are owed to the national banks, right? Like the Federal Reserve Bank. And the weird thing about the Fed is it's actually a for-profit private company. That's weird to think that there's people out there like Oprah and Bill Gates that have a lot of money. And then there's this small group of people that actually own the money. Well, that's their product. Like, what, what a great business model you develop. <laughs> you own the money? Yeah, we just make it up out of nothing and then we sell it to you at interest. <laughs> Can I do that? No, if you do it, it's counterfeiting. We throw you in there. <laughs> The very name Federal Reserve was a deception to make the American people think it was part of the government. The very people that are on the money were against the Federal Reserve System. Jefferson was against it, Jackson was against it, Lincoln was against it, Franklin was against it, and they're on the damn money. That's an insult to their legacies. That's like putting Mother Teresa's face on condoms and passing them out of Planned Parenthood. <laughs> yeah, the Mother Teresa condom. I die to virgins, you don't have to. Whatever. That's just like... <laughs> I just don't trust the banks. I think they're running things. I think we live in financial monarchies, you know? And, and, and here's the thing. If you're with a big bank, especially in the United States, I will no longer accept a check from you, right? I had a buddy of mine owed me $100. He writes me the check. I go into his bank to cash it. I need the money. I'm like, hey, I need to cash this, please. And she goes, okay, Mr. Simmons, we can cash this for you, but it's gonna cost you $6 since you don't have an account here. I'm like, well, he has an account here and he owes me $100, not 94. <laughs> you're actually making him commit fraud right now. She's just like, well, that's just our system. I need to get your fingerprint. I'm like, my fingerprint? You're the one committing the crime here. <laughs> your ability to create money out of thin air isn't business advantage enough. You got to steal our money $6 at a time. Let me ask you something. If that check was for $5, would I owe you a dollar? <laughs> like, yes, you would, sir. You're evil. That's what you are. <laughs> yeah, you want my fingerprints. You need to dust my ankles because that's where they are right now as you read my assets. <laughs> yeah, you're a banker. I'm trying not to go right to you on this. <laughs> My wife gives me crap. She's like, Tom, don't get mad at the banks. It doesn't do any good, right? And maybe she's right, but it's hard not to get mad at them when you read about them. Jesus was the most chill dude ever. The only time he ever used violence in his entire ministry was on the damn money changers at the temple. You know how evil you got to be to piss off Jesus? <laughs> yeah, you got to be a banker or a fig tree, and that is it. <laughs> 